You're listening to Life, the Universe, and Everything Else. Today on the show, Social Contagion. Life, the Universe, and Everything Else explores the intersection of science and society. If you have questions or comments about the show, or you'd like to suggest a topic, you can find us on Twitter or Facebook, or send us an email at lueepodcast at winnipegskeptics.com. Show notes and references can be found at lueepodcast.com. My name is Jim Newman. And with me today, I have Ashlyn Noble. Hello. Laura Creek Newman. Hi there. And Lauren Bailey. Hello. So today we are talking about social contagion. And we're also going to talk a fair bit about the related concept of mass psychogenic illness, which also goes by the moniker mass hysteria. And we'll get into that. So I'm going to begin by sort of setting the stage And then we're going to talk about uh, a few famous uh, historical instances of social contagion and mass psychogenic illness. But let's begin, if you'll forgive me, with hysteria. Colloquially, hysteria is a term describing an excess of emotion, a kind of ungovernable nervous excitement. And as many of our listeners and all of our panelists are uh, aware, it is generally considered to be a heavily gendered pejorative term. Hysteria is, or was, or is? We'll we'll get to that. Uh, A medical diagnosis. The word comes from the Greek hystera, meaning uterus, and the earliest diagnosis of hysteria dates back almost 4,000 years, when Egyptian physicians attributed emotional and behavioral disturbances among women to a wandering uterus— Anyone want to take a stab on how this uh, condition was treated? Uh, lobotomy? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I would say probably not because the Egyptians didn't really know what the brain did, as yeah, far I as I can yeah. remember. <laughs> I don't know. All I can think of, like, for some reason, what's coming to mind is talking about Egyptians and uteruses is, well, I mean, they also put crocodile poo up there in order to stop, con- like, for a contraceptive, so... Uh, you know, maybe a wandering uterus wasn't the, you know, most ridiculous thing they did. Well, I know how it was treated in like the late 19th century and early 20th century. Is it the same way or is it different? (laughs) Oh, this I'm sure was different. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, well, in more recent times, hysteria was definitely treated with orgasm. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) This uh, sounds... Decidedly uh, less fun. Um, Apparently, the two primary cures for the old wandering uterus were, um, well, one option was to apply uh, pungent medicines to the um, pelvic area uh, as a means of encouraging the uterus to uh, wander back where it belongs. (laughs) It tempted it back with good smells or pungent smells? Yeah, sense of smell. The other option was to force the patient to swallow foul tasting herbs to, I think, scare the uterus back (laughs) into its proper place. (laughs) Behave or look what's coming. Uh, Anyway, uh, with apologies to Hippocrates and his oath, uh, ancient Greek physicians apparently didn't know much more about physiology than their Egyptian forebears. And they took that explanation and just kind of ran with it. But they expanded the definition of hysteria to include women who were unable to bear children or who just weren't interested in getting married. In the 19th century, hysteria was a common diagnosis applied to women, giving rise to a whole category of what are now called conversion disorders or functional neurological symptom disorders, such as hysterical blindness or paralysis. And as Laura mentioned, hysteria uh, was uh, treated uh, with orgasm and uh, gave us um, some technological innovations that many people still enjoy today. You can say what it is, Jem. <laughs> is this a family-friendly show after all these years? <laughs> Are we turning a new leaf? It is also interesting to note, I think, that while the term histrionic is 
technically unrelated, as far as we can tell, from an etymological perspective to hysterical. Hysterical comes from the Greek hystera for womb, whereas um, histrionic comes from the Latin histrio for actor. All that acknowledged, uh, histrionic conditions are more often diagnosed in women, and arguably the legacy of hysteria lives on in such diagnoses as histrionic personality disorder, which the APA defines as a condition characterized by a pattern of attention-seeking behavior, seduction, and excessive desire for approval. Sign so, me up for that diagnosis. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I am getting increasingly off topic, something that I'm, I'm prone to do. Uh, we're supposed to be talking about social contagion. So I'll just leave you with this tidbit from the Wikipedia article on hysteria. Quote, Lifestyle choices, such as deciding not to wed, are no longer considered symptoms of psychological disorders such as hysteria. <laughs> Maybe I medically. mean, that's not really true, though. The more yeah, you know. Socially. <laughs> mm, mm -hmm. Well, I mean, and I also think like a lot of psychiatrists and whatnot, you know, would say that they don't consider that part of the diagnosis, but when you actually look at w how they treat people. Yep. So let's move on, uh, with permission from the panel, to uh, the actual topic of today's episode, social contagion. What is social contagion? Well, we don't know exactly. <laughs> uh, we, can, we can describe it, though. Those who study social contagion generally define it as something like transmission that doesn't rely on intent. And at this point, you might ask, transmission of what? Well, behavior and emotions, most often. But when you get right down to it, even ideas, values, and norms can be transmitted this way. And um, here's where I cut my 500-word digression about hidden curricula. Uh, okay, so... Good job, Jem. We're proud of you. <laughs> in their 1993 monograph on the subject, psychologists David A. Levy and Paul R. Nail define social contagion as the spread of affect, attitude, or behavior from person A, the initiator, to person B, the recipient, where the recipient does not perceive an intentional influence attempt on the part of the initiator. So basically, if an emotion, belief, or action spreads from one person to another, and that influence isn't perceived as intentional, that's social contagion. Levy and Nail propose dividing social contagion into three distinct categories. Disinhibitory contagion, echo contagion, and, with apologies, hysterical contagion. There's that word again. So disinhibitory contagion involves the spread of behavior that the recipient actually wants, at least on some level, to engage in, but that they would normally avoid in order to comply with social norms. So uh, witnessing another person in the group engaging in this behavior has a disinhibitory effect. It, it gives license to other members of the group to follow suit. Disinhibitory contagion is characterized by internal conflict uh, in, the, in the person who wants to engage in the behavior but uh, is inhibited from doing so until the disinhibition happens. One thing that Levy and Nail note is that uh, the mimicry in this case is imprecise, which uh, causes it to, to differ from echo contagion, which we'll talk about right away. So the behaviors may change as they spread according to the wishes of the, the people who are engaging in them. Uh, so uh, an example um, of disinhibitory contagion might be uh, nudity at a clothing optional beach. People are normally inhibited from being nude by social convention, but when they see other people in the nude, it gives them license to be nude themselves. Uh, an another example that is often cited is uh, asking questions in a classroom setting where nobody wants to ask a question, but as soon as one person raises their hand and asks a question, you get a bunch of other people asking their questions in a snowball effect because they've been disinhibited. The ice has been broken. Echo contagion refers to spontaneous and comparatively precise behavioral or emotional imitation of other members of a group. Levy and Nail give the example of an early 20th century study of handwriting, which found that when copying down sentences provided for them, subjects would unconsciously mimic the style in which the original sentences had been written. Cool. So the sentences were written uh, in like longhand sort of cursive, and they would um, mimic, they would write in cursive naturally, and they would mimic the slant and size of the original handwriting. Neat. That makes sense to me. Yeah, it's cool. And, and finally, um, so-called... Hysterical contagion represents uh, the unwanted transmission of physical symptoms where no identifiable pathogen is present. 
So I, uh, this transmission would be by social or psychological means. When I was administering COVID vaccines over the summer, one of the pieces of advice we were given is that if a patient is nervous around needles or has a history of fainting, it's best to offer to do the injection in a private room rather than a public area, because fainting can sometimes be contagious. Mm. If true, and I'm not sure how thoroughly this bit of trivia has been vetted, it's been observed, but, you know, people faint. So I don't know how certain it is that this is actually contagion, to be honest. But if true... True, this would be an example of hysterical contagion. With fainting being contagious, I think seeing somebody else faint is going to increase somebody's anxiety level. So if someone is prone to fainting, they are now that much closer to their threshold because they saw someone else do it. Yeah, that's true. You will get a, a vasovagal effect there. So British psychiatrist Simon Wesley further subdivided the category of hysterical contagion into mass anxiety hysteria, which is generally found in children and is characterized by episodes of acute anxiety that spread rapidly and are typically resolved quickly, and mass motor hysteria, which is characterized by physical behavioral changes uh, rather than just simple anxiety, and which spreads more gradually among people of any age and may lead to prolonged outbreaks. But it's important to note that the true etiology of these conditions is poorly understood, and the distinctions made by Wesley, or even the, the, the gross distinctions made by Levy and Nail, are not universally accepted by people who study social contagion. Etiology is the, uh, the ultimate cause. So the, the cause of these disorders and the way they're transmitted is, n is not fully understood. Uh, there are several models, but the actual uh, neuropsychological processes involved are not fully understood. We do know that there are mirror neurons in the brain that help with learning behaviors and with engaging in empathy. So those are almost certainly involved to some extent, probably to a large extent, but you know, the brain is a mysterious place. Two of the phenomena that we'll be talking about today probably fall into the category of uh, so-called hysterical contagion, which goes by many other names, most popularly mass hysteria, though also collective uh, delusion, epidemic hysteria, sociogenic illness, and several others. If there's a preferred categorical term these days, it appears to be mass psychogenic illness, or MPI. While I think it is important to acknowledge these various terms and at least briefly sketch out their history and context, the admittedly clumsy mass psychogenic illness is my term of choice uh, because it, uh, well, for, for a lot of reasons, but notably it does not promote this sort of old school misogyny <laughs> that use of the term hysteria does. MPI is implicated in a wide variety of syndromes, as, as we will see. According to statistics compiled by the Tennessee Department of Health between 1980 and 1990, the most commonly reported symptoms in MPI are headache, lightheadedness, nausea, and abdominal pain. Early in the study of mass psychogenic illness, psychologists supposed that those who were deemed neurotic, prone to extroversion, and those with, and I'm quoting here, lower IQ would be more susceptible to MPI. Um, but uh, prone to extroversion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we talked in the past about extroversion, introversion, and neuroticism, you know, all of those um, personality metrics. Uh, so that's, that's what they're talking about there. But yeah. Um, so the, shall we say, shortcomings of IQ as a measure of anything me meaningful, uh, notwithstanding, uh, these suppositions by psychologists were not actually borne out uh, by the research. According to Bartholomew and Wesley, it, quote, seems clear that there is no particular predisposition to mass sociogenic illness, and it is a behavioral reaction that anyone can show in the right circumstances. Social contagion more broadly has been implicated in a variety of odd historical events, including the dancing sun at Fatima and the Wurzburg witch trials, and in more modern phenomena, including sick building syndrome and the 1995 Ganesha milk miracle, in which statues of the Hindu god were reported to be drinking milk. Today we'll be covering uh, just three instances of social contagion in detail, but I'd be remiss if I didn't briefly mention my favorite historical example that we won't be talking about today, and that is the Irish Fright. Uh, in which panic spread throughout London and then on to at least 19 English counties, with claims that a marauding army of Irishmen was ravaging the English countryside, burning as they went. According to the Bishop of Salisbury, quote, "...country fellows arriving about midnight at Westminster caused a sudden uproar by reporting that the Irish, in desperate rage, were advancing to London and putting all before them to fire and sword." According to newspaper reports, quote, 
An alarm was spread throughout the city and suburbs of Rise, arm, arm, the Irish are cutting throats. This is all very funny, especially to me as somebody of mixed Irish, English, and Scottish blood. But of course, this, like rumors spread about the Jews during the Middle Ages, um, is almost certainly a manifestation of uh, deep-seated uh, ethnic and religious othering, I guess, of, uh, of groups that were uh, systemically disadvantaged, like, like the Irish. So, um, a little bit less funny when you think about it in that, in that context. Everybody wants an excuse to, uh, to murder some Irishmen. I'd also say that an element of that is recognize, like moments of recognizing the fragility of power and things like that, and how they're not actually, you know, safe. Though they can never be safe, quote unquote, the way that they want to be. And there's an example of that as well. And of course, they're going to mm. use their scapegoats. But those moments of saying, like, all of these things, all of this oppression we do, it can still, we can still get freaked out and that because we're living in this big bad illusion. So with that brief, very brief intro to social contagion out of the way, let's move on to uh, a few examples in detail. And we'll start off with Laura, who's going to tell us all about the Tanganyika laughter epidemic. <laughs> Jim. So I'd like to know from the rest of my co-hosts here, what do you know or have you heard of this epidemic? I have not heard of this one. Oh, okay. How about you, Ashlyn? I've heard that like laughing can be contagious, especially like there are groups that come together to laugh together. So, but I hadn't heard of this particular thing where it became a, did it become a problem? Yeah, well, we will we will find out. And Jem, I know that this is one that you suggested, but I don't know how much you know about it. My understanding was that it was an epidemic of laughter that lasted for at least days, maybe weeks, in, uh, I think, a school in Africa. But yeah. I, I don't remember the details. Yes. Yeah. So that's the... That's the broad strokes of the story that people who've heard of it are most likely to have heard. So it is called the Tanganyika um, Laughter Epidemic, which took place in uh, what was then called Tanganyika, which is now Tanzania. Um, and it started, like you said, Jem, in a boarding school for girls in a town called Kashasha, I believe. And from there, it spread within the school and as the story goes, it spread outside of the school to neighboring towns and communities as well and infected, infected, if we want to use that word, a total of a few hundred people by the end of it. And the entire episode lasted from the very start to the end for, it lasted for months on end. It, and it had, wow. there were recurring episodes here. Wow. That's too much laughter. <laughs> it's strange that it lasted so long because I have heard that laughter is the best medicine. <laughs> right? You'd right? think it would be self-curing. You would think so. So much like most of the best dinner party anecdotes, there's a lot that's left out of this bit of the story here. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about what really happened. It really did happen in Tanganyika or Tanzania. It really did start in a boarding school for girls. Uh, this happened in 1962 as well, which um, is important to know. And it seemed to have started with three pupils who came down with bouts of laughing for no apparent reason. But one really crucial thing that is left out of all of these stories is that laughing was only one of the symptoms experienced here. So there was laughing. And what made the laughter notable is that there didn't seem to be any cause for it. There was nothing funny happening. There was not goofing around or something like that. So I think that's why the laughing stood out. But there was also many in the best accounts from the time that we have from the investigators who went in to try to figure out, is there some kind of a physical, biological cause to this? There was also crying. There was also convulsions and anxi physical anxiety type symptoms that happened. So while we, it's called the laughter epidemic, their laughter was one among many symptoms. And so what 
happened there is it started with three girls and it then spread to about 95 of the 159 students at the school over the course of uh, several weeks. So about a month and a half or so. And it would come and go. So it would say that for some people, these bouts would last for up to several hours a day. And for each individual person, it may have lasted for a day or two up to I think the longest accounts were 16 or so days that someone would experience this. But remember, um, it was never constant. It was never as though someone was laughing continuously from the moment they woke until the moment that they fell asleep. Laughter would be one of many symptoms that would come and go during these fits that people would experience. So I think that really changes how we look at this thing. It's not just why is everybody laughing, but it would be one among many symptoms. However, when you're at looking at you know, more than uh, 50% of the, the school population, they did actually have to shut down the school because it was affecting so many students that they couldn't focus on classes. It was quite disruptive, which you can imagine if half of the class is, half of the class is crying or laughing or pacing or doing something like that. The illness did, in fact, spread from the school to the neighboring communities. And one of the biggest reasons for that is that the school needed to be shut down. And so the students went home to their families. And so any of the students who were still being affected by this or exhibiting these types of symptoms, we believe they then spread those types of symptoms to their community members. So it started off at an all-girls school, but then it spread to a variety of uh, community members of different ages and genders as well. And then when the school reopened, there were some relapses and it went forward like that. So all in all, it spanned a several month period. And like I said, several hundred people were affected. So that's the most accurate account of what is what was going on at that time. Like I had said, there were investigators that had gone in to try to find out if there was some kind of a uh, physical or biological cause there wasn't that they could determine. And then the investigation was pretty much done after that. And, and then the, uh, the funny story as we've heard it, or as, as we might hear it at a dinner party or something remained. There's a few things that we want to take into account here. And it's really important to understand that the, the context of what is going on for these individuals, it wasn't just that somebody started laughing and then that made someone else start laughing. In fact, a uh, researcher, uh, C.F. Hempelman, wrote a uh, an entire article about this in hilariously the Journal of Humor, which I think is a great journal name, about how this actually had nothing to do with humor itself. And the laughter wasn't about something being funny at all. In 1962, or at the end of January in 1962, when the outbreak started, Tanganyika or Tanzania had just gained its independence. So there's a lot of upheaval and unknowns at this time. So the social context is one that is full of anxiety. So we can all understand, especially having lived through this pandemic, what that is like when every day has a big question mark in it. It also took place in a boarding school, and the boarding school was run by missionaries, not uh, Tanzanian locals, but of uh, of Western powers. So there's a there's a different dynamic. It was apparently a, quite a strict school, and then there's also the changes for the students who are attending. It's a stressful time to be away from your family and and adjust. So that's one of the reasons why it was believed that. It happened when it did. There was a lot of factors going on in this particular place that seemed to precipitate this type of incident. I looked it up. They were colonized by the Germans and then the British. So they right. did gain their independence from Britain. I also thought this would be a good opportunity to uh, put in the factoid that the most common holiday in the world is uh, independence from the British. I like that. <laughs> Celebrated in the most countries. <laughs> fitting, fitting. Thank you, Ashlyn. That no, that's great. So they've had two different non-local cultures and power structures that have been influencing them and, and play a key role. And then now with the new independence, there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of stress and strife, especially at a school that's still run by, I believe the school was run by German missionaries, even though there's independence. So as Jem was mentioning um, earlier, a lot of times we do see these types of things happening in groups that are sort of the non-dominant male group, if we want to put it that way. And 
as Hempelman rightly points out, I believe, we want to think about what this group means. It, it, for most people in these groups, they're often much more disenfranchised. And so their outlets for anxiety, for um, change, for all sorts of things like that are much more constricted. Particularly, let's think about this context, in a colonial type structure. So if you think about the girls at the school, girls in most cultures are seen as lesser than giving fewer opportunities and rights and so on and so forth. They're at a boarding school. So they're away from their communities uh, and protectors, if you will. They are in a colonial context at that school. So in this case, they had one of the theories is that they had very few outlets for all of this anxiety. And so in some cases that can come out as uh, Jim had mentioned as this um, mass psychogenic illness or as anxiety type symptoms. There's a couple factors that seem to have happened here. One is that it did seem to start with just three people. And we don't know exactly what happened or why it started with these three individuals. But in instances like this, it does seem that if there are individuals who have something like this and they have a bit more social status, that may be triggering for other people. So perhaps they were... I'm going to throw something out, but like the the popular kids in the class, or maybe they came from the um, more notable families in that community or something like that. And so there's a bit of a, an authority or a safety in that by sticking with it. So that can be one of those factors that leads it to spread further than it might have otherwise. So that contagion, that, that social expectation or that disinhibition might have played a role in it. And then it seems strange that, well, why didn't it stop at the school? Well, the thing is, it did sort of stop at the school after a certain point, right? It died down. People had a chance to calm down a bit. But then they went out to their own communities and they were in contact with a lot more people. So if someone started feeling the anxiety again and and started having um, those types of physical symptoms, then now more people than just the pupils at the school would be affected. Um, and not just the, the girls, but maybe the brothers, the uncles, the, the neighbors, and then they would take it elsewhere. And so that's where, why it seems like this very strange epidemic, but it's really just that the people from the small area were no longer staying in their small area. And so if a relapse happened, it spread a lot further. So I'm getting a little bit into the weeds, but I think it's really important to recognize that it wasn't just a few schoolgirls that laughed all day long like they were having the best joke of their lives here. Again, they were also crying, they were shaking, pacing, other types of physical um, anxiety type symptoms. I think one thing that's really interesting to note about this as well, a good point that was brought up again by Hempelman, is that there's those two categories of mass hysterias. And so this one would fall more into that motor mass hysteria. In our Western society, that's very much frowned upon as not okay to express. So we here are far and and Europeans, uh, many Western Europeans would be far more likely to express the nausea, the headache, those physiological constitutional symptoms, whereas because of our inhibitions for the motor ones, whereas in other types of cultures where those types of things are not seen as negative, the anxiety will be expressed in in other ways. And we do have other examples of mass psychogenic illness in other completely different cultures that have those same physical manifestations. So I really think that that's part of what we think is different or interesting is that, you know, we just, we have such a taboo around laughing for no reason or or being physical, uh, like manifesting our feelings physically, that we just don't have a context for normalizing that or, or for saying, oh, yeah, that's a thing that could happen to somebody. And that's where we're like, what happened? That is the, the Tanganyika laughter epidemic. No one laughed for days on end. If anything, the lo- again, the longest accounts, it said it lasted for about a couple of weeks for certain individuals, but then it would die down. And so it was never continuous that whole towns or whole schools were laughing. But it certainly did disrupt life, especially for the students at that school in that time. But it seems like that in the greater context of some of the disruptions, it kind of makes sense. As you've explained it, I realize I have read about this one. I just couldn't remember the name of it because my brain like so many of ours, is uh, adjusted to Western words and to not remember words that are not of Western European origin. Yes, I have heard of this one. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad it rang that bell for you. Well, 
thanks for that, Laura. Now we're going to move on to talk about the Dancing Plague of 1518. While the concept predates the 20th century, the first use of the term social contagion was by Herbert Blummer in his 1939 paper on collective behavior, in which Blummer describes the dancing manias of the Middle Ages. The most well-known and best documented of these dancing manias was the Dancing Plague of 1518, which took place in Strasbourg, which is today the seat of European Parliament. The dancing began in July of 1518, when a woman, identified as Frau Trophea in most contemporary accounts, stepped out into the street and began dancing fervently. She danced without interruption until she collapsed from exhaustion, but after resting, she stood and resumed dancing with vigor. This behavior continued for days, and soon more dancers appeared. Within a week, 30 or so people were dancing with her, and panic was beginning to spread throughout the city. Some blamed demonic possession, while others said it was a case of overheated blood. Overheated blood. Perplexingly, some city leaders decided that the best cure for the dancing was... Any guesses? For more prayer. dancing? More dancing! <laughs> I suppose that this is the like-cures-like approach common to many alternative medicines, such as homeopathy. <laughs> Uh, city authorities constructed a stage in the city center and hired musicians and professional dancers to accompany the afflicted. And for a brief time, the dancing was officially sanctioned. But this, uh, predictably, only exacerbated the problem, and according to contemporary <laughs> reports, the dancers eventually numbered 400 or more. Several are reported to have died from exhaustion, although none of these deaths come from contemporaneous accounts, so they may be later embellishments. The dancing lasted for some two months, eventually subsiding in September. Its cause remains uncertain, but historians have advanced a few hypotheses to explain the event. Sociologist Robert Bartholomew argued for a religious motivation, proposing that the dancers may have been heretics who were convinced that their dancing would curry divine favor, and who managed to convert others to their cause. While this is certainly an interesting hypothesis, I was not able to find any evidence to support it specifically. Although, we will get into kind of a, a tweak on that a little bit later. Another popular explanation for this, and some of the other dancing plagues, involves a fungal disease. Cockspur, formerly Claviceps purpurea, is a fungus that infects several cereal crops, including rye, resulting in ergotoxicosis in those who consume it. Ergotamine is a psychoactive substance. In fact, it was from ergot that Albert Hoffman first synthesized LSD in 1938. Symptoms of ergot poisoning include nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, followed by painful seizures and spasms, mania, and psychosis. Dry gangrene may also follow, as ergot also reduces blood flow to the extremities. Ergotoxicosis has been proposed as an explanation not only for dancing plagues, but also for historical witch trials, including those in Salem, Massachusetts. However, medical historian John Waller does not accept this explanation. He writes in The Lancet, quote, Epidemics of ergotism certainly occurred in medieval Europe when people ate contaminated flour, but this theory does not seem tenable since it is unlikely that those poisoned by ergot could have danced for days at a time, nor would so many people have reacted to its psychotropic chemicals in the same way. The ergotism theory also fails to explain why virtually every outbreak occurred somewhere along the Rhine and Moselle rivers, areas linked by water but with quite different climates and crops. Waller's preferred explanation for the dancing plagues is a stress-induced mass psychogenic illness. Outbreaks of MPI are often triggered by societal stresses, as Laura mentioned. And Waller notes that the region was ravaged by disease and famine. Quote, High levels of psychological distress significantly increase the likelihood of an individual succumbing to an involuntary trance state. It is unlikely to be a coincidence, therefore, that the 1374 dancing plague spread in the areas most savagely hit earlier in the year by the most devastating deluge of the 14th century. The people of Strasbourg and its environs were similarly experiencing acute distress in 1518, after a succession of appalling harvests, the highest grain prices for over a generation, the advent of syphilis, and the recurrence of such old killers as leprosy and the plague. Even by the grueling standards of the Middle Ages, these were bitterly harsh years for the people of Alsace. That's a lot going on. <laughs> yeah. What's more, MPI manifests in ways that are shaped by local beliefs and anxieties. 
Such outbreaks of dancing were sometimes referred to as the Dance of St. John the Baptist, or St. Vitus Dance. St. Vitus was a Christian martyr who today is remembered as the patron saint of dancers and people with epilepsy, and who was traditionally venerated with wild dancing in front of a statue on feast days. Dancing epidemics were blamed either on angry spirits or on the saints themselves, but in either case, local beliefs held that venerating St. Vitus or St. John through dance could cure the condition. So I'll quote Waller again. Those living near these mighty commercial waterways shared a profound fear of wrathful spirits able to inflict a dancing curse. And it is in this region alone, close to the western fringe of the Holy Roman Empire, that confirmed epidemics of dancing occurred. Moreover, these outbreaks nearly always struck in or close to cities affected by earlier dancing epidemics. In short, the epidemiological picture is strikingly consistent with a form of cultural contagion. Only where there was a pre-existing belief in a dancing curse could psychological distress be converted into the form of a frantic dance. Every so often, when physical and mental distress rendered people more than usually suggestible, the specter of the dancing plague could quickly return. All it then took was for one or a few poor souls, believing themselves to have been subject to the curse, to slip into a spontaneous trance. Then they would unconsciously act out the part of the accursed, dancing, leaping, and hopping for days on end. Today, the term St. Vitus Dance has been misappropriated in the medical field as an alternate eponym for Sydenham Korea, a pediatric neurological disorder characterized by involuntary movements that manifest alongside rheumatic fever, and it is uh, completely unrelated to historical dancing epidemics. Was I not listening close enough earlier? I thought you called it the Dance of St. John the Baptist, and then you called it a different St. Vitus? Yeah. Those two different dances, or the same dance? <laughs> so th those are two different names for the same dance. Oh, so okay. Both uh, John the Baptist and St. Vitus were venerated by dance and associated with dancing. Okay, and so I just missed the second one the first time you said it, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sometimes it was St. Vitus dance, sometimes it was St. John's dance. But neither of them are actually related to Sydenham Korea, or Sydenham Korea, which is today called St. Vitus dance. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah. That's a medical condition that is closely linked to rheumatic fever, so uh, group A strep infection. So I'll give Waller the last word on... Uh, the dancing plague. By the mid-1600s, if not before, outbreaks of compulsive dancing had ceased to torment the people of Europe. Their disappearance coincided with the demise of the fervent supernaturalism that had sustained them. In the late 17th century, the term St. Vitus Dance was appropriated to describe a quite different medical condition. But these bizarre events are well worth remembering, for they provide an object lesson in the power of our beliefs and expectations to shape the expression of psychological distress. In an age dominated by genetic explanations, the dancing plagues remind us that the symptoms of mental illness are not fixed and unchanging, but can be modified by changing cultural milieu. At the same time, the phenomenon of the dancing mania, in all its rich perversity, reveals the extremes to which fear and supernaturalism can lead us. Mm -hmm. I think that's really interesting when you can look at the history of when the dancing plague is there. It's very easy to say, oh, well, there's something in the water, or there's something in the soil, or the food, or something. But also there's something in that cultural context. And so if you're worried, like, okay, last time something bad happened, the dancing started, oh no, what if the dancing starts again? So now that idea is automatically planted in your head, right? Mm hmm Yep. That idea is just simmering, whereas somebody who came from the outside wouldn't have that context there. So it just mm. it, it makes sense why it's localized. Well, I was going to just thank Jem for mentioning the ergot thing, because I still hear that as an explanation for some of the dancing plagues, ergot poisoning. And I, I can't mention how much that bothers me. Yeah. <laughs> it's very it different. There are lots of interesting hypotheses that uh, do not really conform to the evidence. Yeah. If you and, were pooping uh, yourself to death, you would not be dancing. Yeah. I'll just tell you that right now. People like the goofy parts of these kinds of stories, right? As both of these instances look at the all of the parts that put into context why people would be doing different things, those get left out. And they just like the idea of like, oh, people were high for months on end and it made yep. them dance. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, people just couldn't found everything funny for months on end. It's like, no, that's not even close to what was happening. No, this was a torturous situation brought on by social mores. Right. I right. think people also, they like 
the ergotoxicosis uh, explanation because it is very neat and it is well grounded in biology or yeah. you know seemingly until you notice that it doesn't actually conform to the to the symptoms uh, as far as we can tell from contemporaneous accounts uh, but it is much less messy than a mass psychogenic illness which is difficult to understand and it doesn't have that neat sort of biological explanation. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm somebody who thinks that psychology is ultimately biology and nothing but biology. But it is biology that we don't fully understand. Mm-hmm. Because we keep chalking it up to ear ergot poisoning. <laughs> <laughs> My biology prof in the first year liked to say biology isn't rocket science. It's much more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> So why don't we move on now to uh, something uh, a little bit lighter, and Ashlyn is going to tell us all about the windshield pitting epidemic of Seattle. Yeah, it's kind of a silly little story. I found it interesting that all of the articles I read about this had almost exactly the same set of facts. So I'm really curious about, like, were there only a few primary sources to go on here? But the media plays a big part in the story, so that's also interesting. Something to keep in mind that I... I don't know how I feel about some of these facts. <laughs> Media loves to play a game of telephone and report. Yeah, yeah. Like on I feel like this might be the equivalent of like those AP stories that just get circulated everywhere with zero extra detail or change. Yep. But here we go. So it started in late March of 1954 when people started noticing small pits in the windshields of their cars. This was in the northwestern Washington state community of Bellingham. Uh, And initially, the people who made the complaints and the police believed that because of the small size of these little divots or pits in the windshields, uh, that maybe it was children or vandals using BB guns. This was the working theory, and they wanted to catch these hooligans because it was 1954. (laughs) (laughs) Well, these days, they wouldn't so much catch them as shoot them dead, but... eh, (laughs) They wouldn't be using BBs against them back. They initially thought they were vandals using BB guns. And reports started to come in from various areas of town, and the police would go there and look around for the vandals, and they wouldn't find any vandals. Rinse and repeat. And then it started to spread out of this tiny little place and into surrounding communities. Surrounding communities started to get uh, reports of, oh God, now my car has pits on it. Come catch them. They must be here because this wasn't here before. And it sort of became a thing that it was sort of spreading out in a wave around Bellingham and it was going towards Seattle. Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) (laughs) It was closing in on the the big city. I'm picturing like the the police like cork board with with strings and a big arrow pointing to Seattle. Yeah. (laughs) On the morning of April 14th, Seattle newspapers ran front page reports of the events that had transpired north of them. The afternoon papers carried similar stories. And then that evening, the Seattle police got a report that three cars had been damaged in a particular area of town, and they rushed to the area and nothing was found. They started uh, getting... All of their police cars would be stopped on the road by people being like, Officer, my windshield is damaged. It wasn't like that when I when we started, you know, ridiculous things. The whole police force was just taken up by dealing with this ridiculous problem. Even police cars parked in front of precinct stations suffered damage. Who could be so bold? April 14th was the day that they had the big newspaper stories. April 15th, they were swamped with calls. 3,000 windshields were reported as being pitted. The mayor of Seattle ended up sending... I guess, telegrams. That's what wired means, right? They telegrammed. Sure. Yes. Lauren's nodding. Jem looks confused. (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm just, I'm just wondering how, how an army of Irish folks with, uh, with slingshots managed to make it all the way to Seattle and piddle. (laughs) (laughs) Slingshots, not BB guns. That's an interesting idea. The mayor of Seattle contacted the governor, Governor Langley, and even President Eisenhower. It was like, please, we're <laughs> oh boy. something is happening. That's my uh, favorite part of this story, the, f- the fact that they called the president. Yeah. <laughs> so I have the text of the telegram that he sent. 
what appeared to be a localized outbreak of vandalism in damaged auto windshields and windows in northern Washington state has now spread through the Puget Sound area. Chemical analysis of mysterious powder adhering to damaged windshields and windows indicates the material may simply be spread by wind and not a police matter at all. Urge appropriate agencies be instructed to cooperate with local authorities on emergency basis. So uh, something is in the wind, and please help. <laughs> This is how uh, I Am Legend begins. <laughs> Wait, just to clarify, to date, no person has been hurt, right? Correct. Okay, good. Priorities. <laughs> but their Model Ts have... <laughs> they were driving Model, Model Ts. Ts in the 50s. <laughs> <laughs> that was so long ago. <laughs> you know, their beautiful, precious cars had yeah. tiny holes in the windshield. Okay, most of them say they were tiny. Some of them said they could measure up to a sixteenth of an inch deep. Okay. <laughs> what? Oh my god! Oh my yeah. god! Oh my! This this oh, was not a big deal. This is infuriating. But please tell the rest of the story. <laughs> <laughs> Much lower stakes than your stories. Definitely, <laughs> nobody died at all. <laughs> I mean, nobody died in my story either, but there was at least oh, legit reason to be upset. <laughs> yeah, and like, you know, it's not fun to cry and laugh for that long. No! Okay, so, the sheer numbers of damaged windshields ruled out hoodlums in the minds of almost everybody. So they decided <laughs> no longer BB guns has to be something coming on the wind. Did it rule out no good nicks, though? <laughs> <laughs> There were many theories that were spread around about what this could be. Would anyone like to guess some of the theories people had? Aliens. The Irish. <laughs> Gem. Oh, this this is 54, you said? Yeah. Oh, Definitely yes. nuclear fallout. Yeah. 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 The I Tannis podcast uh, equates it with Tannis the, in the mythos in the Pacific Northwest. They had an entire episode about this. Lauren really wants everyone to listen to Tannis. I know. I want. I don't have time for podcasts, but it is bonkers. Okay, so here are some of the theories that were going around. The Navy's new million watt radio transmitter at Jim Creek was converting electronic oscillations to physical oscillations in the glass. Navy commander at the time called this theory quote completely absurd. <laughs> <laughs> that's, not, that's not how that works. That's not how anything works. <laughs> Cosmic rays bombarding the Earth from the sun, um, but excuse me, funny. not bombarding the Earth, bombarding northern Washington. <laughs> yes, only and, <laughs> and only, spreading out from a point there, and only the windshields of cars. So little was known about cosmic rays that this theory could neither be proved nor disproved. <laughs> so it just was floating out there, a mysterious atmospheric event. That, that's not an explanation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just something happened in the atmosphere. It was caused by a mystery. <laughs> so for some reason, a big one was the eggs of sand fleas. Somehow sand fleas were laying <laughs> eggs in the glass and then were hatching and causing these pits. And like spreading rapidly again on the wind from this one town for some reason. So people have no idea how glass is made. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I believe this would have been before laminated glass, right? Because you wouldn't, I don't think you would see this kind of pitting uh, these days. Like you get. I, I guess. I don't know anything about it. Non radioactive core debris from nuclear bomb tests. That seems very specific. Yeah. Like very weirdly specific. Well, probably because they, they, they brought out radiation meters and couldn't find any signs mm, of. Yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, I forgot to talk about that. They So, of course, the original one was like, oh, my God, it's something nuclear. We're being attacked. But the sheriff suggested that it might be radioactivity released by recent H-bomb tests in the South Pacific. Mm -hmm. um, and so they brought out Geiger counters to run over all of the windshield glass and all were free of radioactivity. <laughs> but uh, after that, the sheriff was like, no human agency could have created all of this. So there had to be something else going on. I actually don't, I didn't run across any information that anybody ever blamed it on aliens. Hmm. I'm sure someone had did. A lot of people will argue against uh, using the term Geiger counter for, for radiation detectors just because um, Geiger, you know, was a Nazi. <laughs> oh, okay. But, Good to yeah. know. What did you call it? Just a radiation detector? Yeah. That's fair. Again, that was the 14th and the 15th. The sergeant of the Seattle Police Crime Laboratory declared after all of the testing was done and they had done whatever they could, the reports are 5% hoodlumism 
and 95% public hysteria. <laughs> <laughs> Hoodlumism, not hooliganism? Hoodlumism. Isn't that a good word? Ooh. I really liked this kind of analysis from one of the articles that I read uh, from Nitarama. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it really puts it in a way that I didn't want to paraphrase it because it was just a really good suggestion. The Seattle pitting incident has all the key factors, including ambiguity, the spread of rumors and false but plausible beliefs, mass media influence, recent geopolitical events, and the reinforcement of false beliefs by authority figures like the police, the military, and political figures. Uh, This combination of factors added to the simple fact that for the first time people actually looked at their windshields instead of through them caused the hubbub. (laughs) Yeah, yep. That's what I was thinking. (laughs) It just ended up being people were hearing that other people's windshields were damaged. They looked at their windshields. Oh no, they are damaged. I have also been a victim. Um, They tried to prove to people over and over again, like, for example, why isn't the back windshield of your car got any issues? How come the windows of our houses haven't been effective? How come no other glass is displaying this kind of issue? Um, One of the things that really freaked people out was they also found it on, like, airplane glass and the glass of basically all large vehicles. Uh, Because that's what happens. It was 1954. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, My favorite part, though, is by April 17th, there were no more reports of pitting incidents because they had published, hey, we think it's basically not a thing. And then all of a sudden, nobody was concerned anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Nobody wanted to be called or be told that they were making it up. So they stopped. Of course, today, I'm sure that those reports would have absolutely no effect. Yeah, yeah. The government's covering it up. Yeah, exactly. I, I'm really reminded uh, of the way sort of network contagion, social contagion, like spreads online these days and how it becomes oh, yeah. so much harder to eradicate. Like, mm-hmm. you know, obviously thinking about all of the COVID misinformation out there and like that. Um, and because there are so many additional vectors for social contagion now or, or new and exciting vectors, uh, it is uh, it is really tough and it's something that's going to be with us for a long time, I think. One thing that I came across in my research is the idea that these mass psychogenic illnesses, we often think of it as, um, I mean, I, I guess one idea that I came upon in my research is that while we think of these mass psychogenic illnesses as these very discreet and unusual types of events, these types of things have continued happening and it's not just left in the fifties or sixties or 1500s or anything like that. You know, there are, there are instances in the eighties. I mean, now even what we're seeing could be considered it. Um, and one great example, I, I thought this was a really interesting way of thinking of it is like the moral panic or like the satanic panic and that of yes. the eighties, that's yep. like a mass psychogenic illness right there. Mm-hmm. People aren't dancing in the streets uncontrollably. People aren't having bouts of uncontrolled emotional outbursts and, and things like that. But they are in a way because they are their whole lives are disrupted by something that suddenly appeared and they are having anxiety symptoms and difficulty coping and all of those types of things. So I, I thought that was a really great way of contextualizing that these are not things that are gone. We're not past them. And looking at how people react, even today with the anti-vax things or the COVID conspiracy things and the way that people are legitimately upset or or having breakdowns over it, even though it's not true and and there's a lot of misinformation, like that's that's a mass psychogenic illness. (laughs) I mean, how many people are listening to Joe Rogan tell them to eat horse paste? Right. And how many are doing it just because it's, I would consider that a mass psychogenic event. And if your, um, if your reaction on hearing Lauren call it horse paste is ivermectin is for humans as well. Well, uh, it, it can be if you have yeah. a prescription. You know, parasitic worms. Yeah. <laughs> but that's not what COVID is. No. 
and people are legitimately going to feed stores and getting things that have pictures of horses and sheep on the bottles and that have taste like apple. They're not making applesauce for humans that they sell in the feed stores. I'm sorry, folks. In a lot of cases, especially when you don't have any uh, insurance coverage, uh, you're not going to be able to afford human ivermectin if you if you do manage to get a prescription for it anyway, uh, although there are plenty of doctors uh, who will sell you a prescription for it in the States. But it is very common in disadvantaged communities to uh, buy the veterinary equivalents of medicines uh, yep. because they often function very similarly uh, and are uh, a lot cheaper. Uh, which is just a reflection of the the sort of precarity and desperation that a lot of people find themselves in uh, due to, oh, you know, our good friend capitalism. I did not mean to demean anybody who has to feel like they need to go out to alternative routes for, but ivermectin does not cure COVID. Just no, but no. that's the thing. 99% of people who are currently in the market for ivermectin should not be in the market for ivermectin. <laughs> Yeah. Now, there, there was a big preliminary study that was published on um, preprint server that showed that ivermectin uh, does help for COVID. And that study was completely fraudulent, as was well uh, documented. So uh, that's a cool story to, to go look up. There are lots of problems with preprint servers. But yeah, that uh, ivermectin does not do anything for COVID and is uh, extremely dangerous in a lot of cases, especially the way people are taking it. And of course, uh, nothing in this podcast should constitute medical advice. Consult your own physician, please. Okay, well, uh, with that uh, bright spot behind us, uh, why don't we move on to something nice? <laughs> Who has a something nice to share this month? My something nice is, well, I have started a new Stardew save file. Nice. Yeah. And I picked the biggest farm, the Four Corners farm, and I've laid it out with my different plots and everything. And I've just started the second year, so I've got, you know, a little bit of fake money. And I've started to lay out my farm how I like it, and it's very soothing. God, I love that game so much. That's lovely. Mm -hmm. That's my something nice, <laughs> is playing baby video games. I call The Sims my dollhouse, so I'm just <laughs> sitting there playing with dollies when I'm playing The Sims. <laughs> I actually like I've uh, I loved Stardew Valley and Kira got into it after she kind of uh, got tired of Animal Crossing and so we've uh, we've been farming together. Lovely, yeah. it's such a calming game. I made Ashlyn mm -hmm. and Dave look at my farm the other day. <laughs> you didn't make us, <laughs> Ashlyn. Why don't you go? Uh, we went on a really lovely hike yesterday. Lauren and myself and our friend Aaron. We went out to Epinette Creek in spruce woods and i had previously done the devil's punch bowl there uh where it's all hills and all of them are made of sand so you have to basically climb up every hill twice because you put your foot in and you sink and you put mm -hmm. your foot in and you sink and it was oh it was definitely the hardest hike i've ever done it was very hard <laughs> um i was i remember saying when i got home i looked at my fitbit data and at no point did i hit what they call the peak heart zone so i said my heart just doesn't go that high because i could not possibly have worked harder um but this uh trail that we went on was really close to it is it's in the same provincial park um and aaron had told us that it was lots of hills and sand dunes so i was like oh god it's gonna be this again except longer mm -hmm. so i was like really prepared to put all the effort in and it was like really fine uh, <laughs> so yeah it was just, a great hike yeah just really happy with how good my conditioning has gotten for stuff like that too and like this morning both of us feel fine we're doing good we're gonna go for another we're gonna try to go to a Cinnaboyan forest after we record and see if we can do back-to-back -back 10K days. Nice. Ooh, nice. That sounds awesome. Good for yeah. you. Yeah, I'm worried about the state of my quads, but... <laughs> <laughs> it feels really good to feel good in my body. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. And I got jealous, which is why I'm hiking with her. <laughs> there is something to be said for feeling good in your body, gotta say. How about you, Laura? I think my general something nice, it's nothing that happened this month per se, but uh, my best friend lives in the same city as I do now. And I just love that. I just Yay. love knowing that. Um, so it's not, a, it's not a new thing, but I just want to throw that out there. 
still um, relatively new, right? It's still relatively new, but um, does she listen? Sorry, no. Could she, she doesn't. does. She listen? <laughs> no, <Could> she? <laughs> not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Adam might. We'd see, but um, yeah. So that's that's a general something nice. A more specific something nice. I have some really really lovely peppers growing in my garden. This year, my pepper plants, the few that made more than one, made some really good sized hefty peppers. And nice. that is something that I don't always get. So I'm happy about that. Yeah, we got one pepper this year, so I'm jealous. Oh, I was telling Very Gem. Very small, out of oh. two plants. <laughs> oh. I, um, yeah, I, I did okay with, I did better than with peppers, but I like actually... I don't even know if this worked, but I watered a lot and I put some skim milk powder in it because I'm like, I've heard that peppers like calcium, so mm. <laughs> I'm going to do that. No idea if that works, but I got some nice peppers and Gem is going to enjoy lots of green peppers. Always do. <laughs> Provided somebody else cuts them. Oh, who, who needs to cut a pepper? Just bite right into that thing. Oh, I, 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 I thought you You've I thought gotten you were over your of fear inside. of mold? Yeah, yeah I... Uh, I did some studying and uh, and discovered a while back that uh, that pepper mold is actually not much to write home about. Well, all right then. Science, I usually, folks. I usually bite a bite a hole in it, sort of peer peer inside, and then uh, and just nibble away. <laughs> I mean, speaking of gardening, another nice thing that we've had is that it feels like July out there. It's been so nice. It's almost October, and we were still hiking in short sleeve shirts yesterday. So that's pretty cool. Hmm. Jim, what's your something nice? My something nice this month is uh, is also long walks. Something that I started doing at the end of last year as I was studying for exams, I think I did this during my renal block, uh, was just going for like, you know, hour long, sometimes two hour long walks and just studying as I just wander. Uh, and that's really nice. Like just just walking 10k while I'm studying uh, is lovely, and um, I've discovered some new routes that I like to take, especially when it's not too sunny. Uh, sort of out in the the less developed parts of the city, and it's just very pleasant. It it makes you know the truly absurd amount of studying that I have to do uh, a little bit more bearable. I'm assuming you're studying via audio, and you're not walking around with your nose in a textbook. No, I'm not studying via audio. I'm studying via um, sometimes my notes, but mostly my Anki decks um, uh, with my uh, with my phone held up in front of my face as I walk. <laughs> okay, which to be fair is not a lot different from how he w- moves through the world normally. So he's That's used to it, true. or me me either. So I can't I can't judge. <laughs> Usually, I am buried in some kind of audio medium as I as I wander about, but. Uh, when I'm studying, it's, it's just me and the Anki decks. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice, intimate relationship. <laughs> yeah. I like to put my podcasts on, on some nice headphones, and just walk, walk, walk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I wish I could be more active during the day with my work. That would be great. Ditto. <laughs> so what are we talking about next month, Ashlyn? Next month on Life, the Universe, and Everything Else, more cryptids! Yay! My favorite! Well, thanks for joining me tonight, folks. Thank thanks, you. Jim, for having us. Always a pleasure. Good night. Good night. Good night, night folks. <laughs> Good afternoon, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Life, the Universe, and Everything Else is produced by Jem Newman and Ashlyn Noble, with mix and tech production by Jem Newman. If you want to support the show, the best way to do that is with a review on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, or by sharing an episode with a friend. Original music is produced by Ian James, and this episode was edited by Lauren Bailey. Life. Don't talk to me about life. I will just take a moment while you're looking to note that Geiger was not officially, I think, a member of the Nazi party um, and did a little token opposition of their uh, their interference at universities. But he also did not support his Jewish colleagues when they were fired for being Jewish mm. and like that. So.
Not a not a great guy.